And hello everyone. I was looking for a nuclear reactor simulator and I found this in the Nuclear Institute web page, which they call nuclear reactor simulator. But actually it's not. Actually it just explains the different components of a nuclear power plant. But actually the graphics are quite nice, so I decided to go through this just to make a brief explanation. So we'll start clicking the different panels here. And you see when I click each of them, the thing is zoom in 3D, which is quite nice. So let's go to the reactor pressure vessel. And it seems that this is an AP-1000 or a like nuclear reactor. So AP-1000 from Westinghouse or something like that. Uh, around 1000 megawatts of electric output power and pressurized water. So what we see in the reactor is a pressure vessel that needs to hold around 150, 160 megapascal of pressure of water to keep this water from boiling because of the heat. And very interestingly, we see that the control rods are inside the pressure vessel. So everything is surrounded by the pressure vessel. So it needs to account for the displacement of the control rods during its uh, movement, during the controlling of the reactor. That's why we see this empty space here, because now the rods are totally inserted. This is a shutdown state. Um, it's made of steel and then it has a lining inside of st stainless steel because actually the high neutron activity could accelerate corrosion. So because usually these nuclear rea reactors have a lifespan of 40 years, it needs to withstand corrosion for all this time. So uh, it has some lining of stainless steel. Stainless steel is mainly steel combined with nickel and chromium. Uh, usually about 20 or 25 percent of these two alloys plus 80 percent of iron or steel and I cannot know the properties unless they tell what's the denomination of this steel but anyways the higher the chromium and nickel it has the more expensive and the more corrosion resistant usually and we see here inside like the foil elements and control rods and it's it's like the heart with the vent and and arteries going coming out and in. These are the primary cooling loops. So let's go to the next next one. Is a foil rods. So here we see the foil assemblies, which are square prismatic, in contrast with the VVER Russian design, which are hexagonal. So these are like a look look from above are like a chessboard of quadrangular foil elements. And they have a length of three meters. There are 300 foil pellets in each one of the foil assemblies. Foil pellet is a little like a peel of fuel inside the zirconium zirconium cladding. So these tubes we see here are made of zirconium and foil pellets are actually inside. And the enrichment is around five percent between three and five percent of uranium two three five. Okay, let's go to the next, which will be control rods. And there is not much less, no much more to see here. Control rods are just absorber elements that control the nuclear reaction. And actually, this is very interesting because this is the lacking element in the uranium project of the Nazi Germany that Werner Heisenberg did not account in his document. So it seems that they did not plan to reach criticality in the experiments because they just didn't even mention the possibility of implementing a controlling device like a control rod. So they just were experimenting with the increased chain reaction in the context of a nuclear material um, together with a moderator, but they didn't want to re reach criticality. To reach criticality, it's mandatory to have a controlling element. So you need a surplus reactivity. So you need a core that has much more reactivity of the need to reach criticality. And then you need element, an element to control, which is the control rods. And they are made of boron, or they can have other elements that, have, that are good neutron absorbers. Let's see. The next, which is the coolant system. 
And as I said, with the simil, with the health, uh, science stuff, so this is like a heart, and here you have the vent and arteries coming in and out. So this is making water circulate to extract the heat from the reactor, going to these tall things that are the heat exchangers. Sorry, well, yes, heat exchanger, or I'm not sure how they call it in a PWR, I will check later. So they pump the heat to this heat exchanger that is inside of this pile and which vaporizes water. So probably we can call also water boiler, these things. And here we see two, but probably there are four in this design. So there, mar there must be two more in the, like out of the plane, but they don't put here because otherwise it would be too messy. Um, is there something else to say about this? Yeah, the flow is 330 liter liters per second, and this is critical to maintain the fuel at the operating temperatures without making the water boil. Next, moderator. So we are always zooming to the same place. Moderator is water. So in a PWR reactor, moder the moderator and the coolant are the same thing, are the water. The moderator is a thing that is meant to slow down neutrons, so they have a higher probability, probability of hitting another feasible element and undergoing chain reaction. So why you need a moderator? You need this to allow for a much smaller reactor and much lower enrichment. Could you do a nuclear reactor without moderator? Yes, you could, but you would need a very high enrichment of your material and probably a very huge volume of this material to its criticality. For instance, RBMKs use unenriched uranium or very mildly enriched uranium, and they are very huge reactors, but they use a very good moderator, which is graphite. So uh, if you wanted to not use moderator, you would need a very high enrichment. In atomic bombs, actually it's a very different physics because you are using fast neutrons, not slow neutrons. But basically what you are doing is to reach criticality in a very, very small space, which is like the size of half of, half of a basketball. And, and you, you need a very high enrichment. I think it's more than 80%, but I don't know, I don't know exactly the numbers of, of uranium-235 for a U-bomb, or I'm not really sure about plutonium, plutonium bombs. But it's a different physics because it's using fast neutrons and it doesn't use any moderator. So it's using the fast neutrons without moderating to, to make the chain reaction. So let's continue. In our simulation, moderator containment shield, this is my subject. So we see here containment, the explanation says that is usually made of reinforced concrete plastic steel plate. Actually, it's not very precise, it's not reinforced concrete. Even if re reinforced concrete in a broad sense, it also applies to pre-stress. But actually, this precisely it's a pre-stress concrete. The difference between plain, plain reinforced concrete and pre-stress concrete is that the plain reinforced or not pre-stress using passive reinforcement the reinforcement only has some stress when you deform your structure or you, when you load the structure. So basically the steel inside the concrete is doing nothing until, until you load it. It doesn't mean you need to step on it or have an earthquake. Just by, by its own weight, it can have load. But the case of a nuclear uh, power plant containment building is not this. It, need, it needs to sustain a pressure of 0.5 bar in case of a local accident, which is a case in which you lose primary coolant. And to achieve this, because uh, concrete is not impermeable, you need to make sure that it's under pressure. So what you do is to pour the concrete of the building, but you leave some, some tubes which have tendons inside made of steel. Once the concrete is hardened, so it has strength, then you will pull these cables 
So it will give extra stress, not only the own weight, but the stress from these cables. So you make sure that this concrete is always under compressive stress, even in the event of increasing the inner pressure of this building. This makes sure that even with 0.5 of, of positive pressure inside the building, cracks in the, op in the concrete will not open. So you have the op maximum uh, impermeability you can have with a concrete structure. And then it says uh, it also has a thick steel plate. Well, I'm not really sure about this design because, of course, there are several designs. But actually, the steel, the concrete alone, can do its job. The extra shielding, I'm not really sure if it holds some pressure or it's uh, for other purposes. But if the steel is built to be watertight or pressure tight, then for sure you can design the concrete in the concrete in another way. So it does not need to to, to be heavily pre-stressed to, to assure that, that there are no cracks. So I'm not really sure. And then it says that most modern uh, um, containment buildings can withstand the impact of planes. Well, yes, most modern means most nowadays designs, which means most of reactors in the world do not or we don't know if they withstand or not uh, airplanes, but they were not designed for that purpose. I think most of new designs, so the concept is not the one of the picture. The concept is making a building that can withstand the local accident, so the 0.5 bars of pressure inside the building. And then you make like a deflector, at, I don't know exactly how many meters, but maybe 10 or 20 meters from the from the building, which is just a retention wall, not very stiff, but it reaches a height, not the top of the building, but maybe this height. So in the case there is a plane that hits this first wall, this will dissipate a lot of energy and it will like crash or smash the plane into little fragments that when they hit the main retaining structure will not be able to damage it significantly. So this is a more intelligent design. So you don't make like a like a tank. You make a several layer structure that can dissipate energy. And actually, this is the same way in which the, the ISS, the International Space Station, is built. Because in the space you have little fragments of debris and things that travel at many thousands of kilometers per hour. Like one little fragment of one millimeter could pierce the walls of the ISS and kill everyone inside because it will depressurize, etc. So what they did is they built a shield. It's like an aluminum foil. foil. I'm not sure it's, if it's aluminum or some plastic or what, but it's really a foil. It's very thin and it is mounted with a, with a kind of uh, bar structure, very thin structure because this doesn't have any weight or any inertia. And then in the case of these little uh, debris particles hits this shield because of the very high speeds, these little particles will, um, will be turned into dust and the dust will still hit the walls of the ISS. But because it's dust, it's not a solid particle, it will have a less much probability to damage it. So this is the same idea of building this second wall outside reactor buildings to avoid the danger of planes. And by the way, it seems most of nowadays reactors could withstand a passenger plane impact because of their velocities are not too high. Even if the plane is very massive, very heavy, the mass is not enough. It seems most of simulations say it's not enough to destroy one of these buildings. But what for sure it's enough to destroy one of these buildings, it's a supersonic plane. So like uh, jet planes, sorry, no, not jet planes, uh, fighter, fighter jets, like army stuff. These things that can go at higher speed at Mach 1, this will very likely pierce the concrete of these buildings and destroy the structure. So the last sentence says, also prevent the release of radioisotopes from internal accidents such as core meltdown. Well, this is deliberately not true. 
But I'm really amazed that they put these sentences here. The, the building is designed to, to hold the radiation that is released in a local accident. Full dot. Nothing else. A local accident, the volume of the building and all the protection systems are designed so the pressure will not surpass 0.5 bars. And the concrete is designed to withstand this pressure. That's it. There is nothing else than that. If there is a core meltdown, that's much more than a local accident. Local accident is just piercing some primary circuit or something, or the reactor itself, pressure vessel, and you lose coolant. But it doesn't state that there is meltdown. If there is meltdown, then we're in the case of Fukushima. It's a much more severe situation in which the pressure will keep building up because you are not able to cool down the reactor. And if there is meltdown, it will evaporate water that it finds around. It can keep melting down through the concrete structure. And while it does so, it will melt water that is uh, embedded within the structure or because of the cooling systems that are spraying water around. And if this happens, the pressure will keep increasing until the building cannot hold it anymore and the building will just shatter into pieces like it happened in Fukushima. But it has to be said, in Fukushima, the building that it shattered into pieces, it was not the containment itself. So it was the reactor building, but actually the containment of the reactor itself was much smaller than a PWR. Uh, containment building. So that one cannot hold a big volume of coolant steam in the case of a local accident. So because it's a BWR, it, it was not a PWR or uh, some similar design to BWRs. So that steam is, I think it's passed through a toroidal shape that is in the basement or in the foundation of the building and it has water on it. So the steam goes through the water uh, maybe I'm mixing things here because I know about BWRs and I assume Fukushima is very similar to those designs. But ultimately, because there was a meltdown of the core and the core continued producing heat and steam and hot gases, this continued building up pressure and the building ultimately could not resist this pressure. So this is what happened in a meltdown and none of these buildings will really give you warranty of withstanding the pressure that builds up after a meltdown. It's only for the case of local accidents. Okay, let's go to the next. So I told you this was my thing, the reactor building. Steam generator. Oh, yeah, this, this is the name. Steam generator. Well, so this is just the, this big vertical piece in which you have a heat exchanger here, which is made of very small, well, small from from this scale we are looking at, but it's made for uh, out of many tubes, many plumbings, to have a high contact area so it has the maximum heat exchange to the secondary circuit and make water boil. I guess the boiling occurs here and then the bubbles go up and then here you have mainly dry steam and then the steam goes through the main steam line to the turbine. In VVERs, Russian design, this is placed horizontally. This is suboptimal in terms of boiling and heat transfer, but it's better for containment design because having this placed horizontally saves you some height in the containment building so you can make the containment overall shorter, saving a lot of concrete and pre-stress work. Let's see what is left. Pressurizer. Yes. This is something we don't have in boiling water reactors. This is meant to keep the pressure in the primary circuit. And you see there's a level of water here. This water is kept at 345 degrees centigrade. And the remaining space is made up of steam or it could be nitrogen in case you inject, inject nitrogen. Operators has the control of a nit uh, liquid nitrogen tank here. They can inject it to, to balance the pressure in case they need it. If you have too much pressure in the reactor and you want to decrease, the tool operators have, it's a shower here, 
So it's just a shower plate that pumps water and it produces rain inside the pressurizer. Because the water is cold or ambient temperature and it rains through hot steam at 345 degrees, it makes the steam condensate. And this creates vacuum that sucks water from the primary to increase this level and reduces the pressure. So the, these are the two tools that we have. Sorry, I forgot to say there are also heaters. So there are heaters that work with electricity. So like a big uh, electric radiator here. So if we want to increase pressure, we turn on the heaters. They will heat the steam and they, it will expand. It will push this water down and this will increase the pressure of the primary circuit, including the reactor, of course. And if we want to decrease the pressure, show, cold shower, it will contract, it will do the contrary. Then we also have, if we want to, to manage this level of water, let's say we, we want to reduce this level of water, but without changing the pressure, then we will inject nitrogen. Uh, we, we can do this, we, we can also use the heaters, but let's say the temperature is already too high, it's above 345, and we want to reduce level, so then we will use a nitrogen injection and um, release water from some other point in the circuit. Okay, we are almost finished. Pressurizer and turbine generator. Turbine generator, why they put all in the same sentence? Okay, this is a turbine. Here we have the high pressure part of the turbine. The main steam line goes here which arrives at around uh, 60 bar, which is 6 megapascal. This, I remind you, this is the secondary circuit, it's not the primary. And after going through the primary, the high pressure of the turbine, it goes through this higher diameter um, tube or um, yeah, pipe because it, it increased volume, because it decreased pressure. I don't, I'm not really sure about the pressure here, but it's below 60. And it goes to the low pressure part of the turbine, which is much bigger here. And should be attached to the condenser, which I guess it's below, which has negative pressure because we're condensating the steam with the cold water from outside the plant. And here we have the generator, it's this red painted thing that turns the rotation of the turbine into alternating electric current. And that's it. That was the simulation, which was not actually a simulation. And I was actually cropping down the screen because the resolution of this is not full HD. So probably you will not have a great resolution. And I will just make a comment here. So then reactor containment here with the inner steel linings Reactor in the center inside uh, like a concrete trench. I guess this concrete trench not only provides like the like the foundation of the reactor, but also protects from the radiations to the operators around the reactor building. Then you have turbine building here, which is attached to the reactor building, but outside the containment, because the water here is not uh, irradiated. And below you have some tanks of water and things that I'm not really know what they are at this moment. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this fake nuclear reactor simulation. See you in the next video. Bye.